Welcome, everyone. I'm Fei Fei Li, the Denning co director of the Stanford Institute for Human Centered Artificial Intelligence, or HAI, and the Sequoia Professor of Computer Science at Stanford. I want to extend the warmest welcome to everyone on behalf of myself and my partner, HAI's co director, Professor John H. Mendy. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to recognize the victims of COVID-19 and their families around the world. As the pandemic, uh, pandemic continues to spread, the importance of international cooperation becomes more urgent. I'm honored that Stanford HAI is serving as the host of this event today, where we are formally launching the collective and augmented intelligence against COVID-19 Alliance, which we call Kayak. As you will hear about in more details later, Kayak aims to structure the rapidly expanding collection of global health, social, and economic data on the pandemic to enable the world's decision makers to confidently take action. By turning data into knowledge, Kayak will help those leading the fight against COVID-19, including multilateral institutions, policymakers, public health officials, and the scientific community. Stanford HAI and the Future Society are leading this alliance with the support of UNESCO and the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Kayak will be advised by leading United Nations entities in the fight against COVID-19, starting with UNESCO, the World Bank, and United Nations Global Polls. We're also working with leading private sector entities, including Stability.ai, C3.ai, Element AI, Access, GLG, and the Planet on the technology that combines human and artificial intelligence to power this decision-making platform. We're also pleased to announce that the World Health Organization has signed on as one of the first users. The platform will be available to multilateral organizations, governments, and global entities working to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. Kayak will also collaborate with technical, scientific, and civil society partners around the world to collect data on COVID-19, identify critical domains where structural information on the pandemic is needed is needed the most and ensure a multi-stakeholder governance process. At Stanford HAI, our mission is to advance AI research, education, policy, and practice to improve the human condition. Our work aims to guide AI based on its human impact, advance the frontiers of this technology, and develop applications of AI in service of humanity. We do this through interdisciplinary collaborations that bring together technical experts with those in the fields as diverse as medicine, law, social science, humanities, and the arts, among others. But while in some areas, such as drug discovery, AI can lead us in promising new directions, we recognize that AI is only one piece of a much more complicated puzzle that we need to solve in order to emerge from this pandemic. In fact, researchers across disciplines at Stanford have been working on the medical, economic, and societal aspects of the pandemic since its earliest days. We look forward to sharing what Stanford can offer to those working to combat this crisis, working closely with our distinguished kayak partners. We have a full agenda today, featuring speakers representing the many organizations participating in this effort, who will share 
how their organizations plan to contribute to or benefit from Kayak. And we hope that many more of you in the audience will join us in this fight. And now I would like to introduce HAI's Deputy Director, Mike Salito, who will be our MC for the remainder of today's events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fei-Fei, for that kind introduction. Before we move on to our next speaker, I just wanted to make a quick logistical note. Of course, today's event is entirely virtual, and so please bear with us if there are any glitches with the audio or video. We'll do our best to keep things running smoothly. Now I'd like to move on to Buthena Guermazi, who's the Global Director of Digital Development for the World Bank. Buthena, please turn on your camera and video. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh... A pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to join you in this uh, session today. Uh, four months ago, this meeting would have been organized in a, in a conference room or a business center. So who would have imagined that Zooming would become such a buzzword, uh, an integral part of our new normal. So I'm, I'm very excited to be Zooming with you today. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic really showed us that further acceleration in digital transformation is more necessary than ever in this uh, COVID area. Uh, di disruptive technologies and AI should no longer considered a luxury. The crisis has also highlighted the importance of reliable, reliable data for policymaking to, to fight the pandemic. I think we do have a unique opportunity to capitalize on such a shift. Uh, first, data is more abundant than ever before and is increasing in unprecedented way, uh, creating new opportunities, reshaping existing ones, helping us reimagine sectors. Uh, governments around the world are seeking to leverage such data to accelerate economic growth, to improve their efficiency and transparency and tackle persistent socioeconomic development challenges. The opportunities of data-driven development are both abundant and compelling. Uh, in these unprecedented times, technology's ability to access, to mine, to analyze digital data on a global scale can play a vital role. It can help governments, health institutions, researchers to make the appropriate decisions to contain and manage COVID-19's rapid progression and explore new ways for the near future. However, we all know that data remains in silos uh, with uh, desperate and disparate quality. Therefore, there are significant challenges in determining meaningful information and insights in the fight against COVID-19. Building a multi-stakeholder collaboration at a global scale is more important than ever for securing access to quality data and modern digital infrastructure while offering unique perspectives on the roadblocks and opportunities to address this crisis. So the World Bank is um, an active player uh, in this field and we're very excited to be partnering with the Kayak partners. Uh, there is a growing consensus within the World Bank on the importance of leveraging knowledge, resources, convening power to support our member countries in their digital transformation uh, and to use digital as a way to cope and fight and recover from COVID. Uh, in the short term, the World Bank has, together with the World Econ uh, Economic Forum, with ITU and GSMA, we focused on immediate need for what we called uh, a global crisis response uh, for digital development. Uh, and we plan to work very closely with many partners in, 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 in this endeavor. But the crisis showed us that we need to think beyond the immediate emergency responses. And we need to think about how we can better leverage data and AI for development. So we consider the importance to be active in at least three fronts. One, building the digital foundation from the infrastructure side, scaling investment in modern digital and data infrastructure to allow this revolution. The second one is focusing on creating appropriate and enabling policy and regulatory framework 
for expanding data-enabled AI ecosystem. And all of this doesn't make sense if people and humans behind it do not have the capacity to lead it. So the third one for us is building and focusing with client countries and with you know, partners in the broader ecosystem for building digital capabilities for promoting data sharing and operationalizing the use of trustworthy AI for development. So ladies and gentlemen, it is precisely in times like these that we as members of the global development community must ensure that data is used to build better lives, improve the lives of the poorest. We hope that the next edition of our World Development Report, which is Data for Better Lives, would also help us contribute to this discussion. Now is the time to act, to mainstream data sharing for development, harness artificial intelligence, a powerful enabling technology that will help us augment our capabilities and empower every individual, every organization, and every community to improve the way forward. We are very happy in the bank to support the global digital cooperation initiatives, such as the nascent Kayak Collective and Augmented Intelligence Against COVID-19 that aims to take on complex COVID-19 data. We do look forward to working very closely with you to promote trusted and quality data sharing and harness trustworthy AI for achieving balanced and sustainable ways to development. I wish you all a very successful launch and insightful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Buthena, for sharing your insights. We're really pleased to have you and the World Bank as part of for Kayak. Now I'd like to introduce Moez Chakshuk, who's Assistant Director General for Communication and Information at UNESCO. Moez, please share your video. Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking Professor Fei Fei Li for hosting us, even virtually, at Stanford for the launch of the Collective and Augmented Intelligence Against COVID-19 initiative and platform, as well as the AI initiative for the, of the Future Society for their continued commitment to translating digital cooperation into life-safe action. The importance of harnessing digital technology and ensuring global cooperation in the fight against COVID-19 cannot be underestimated. I would like to echo United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who recently underlined that far from distracting us from the urgency of digital cooperation, is making it more important than ever. Our response to the COVID-19 pandemic has underlined that not only is global digital cooperation possible, but it's necessary in order to build inclusive digital societies, develop human and institutional capacity, protect human rights and agency, and promote digital trust. And yet, the digital divides between those on and offline, those who know how to use the tools and have access to relevant content, and those who don't, are threatening to become the new face of inequality. They are enforcing the educational, social, and economic disadvantages suffered by women and girls, people with disabilities, minorities, and the vulnerable. Bridging these digital divides has become a matter of life and death for people unable to access essential healthcare information during the COVID-19 pandemic. The United Nations Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, launched last month, underlines the crucial role digital technology will play in the COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 world, and our collective respons responsibility to connect the, un the unconnected, protect the vulnerable, and marginalized, and respect human rights in the digital era. In this context, Artificial intelligence represents a great opportunity to accelerate the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and overcome this pandemic. But any technological revolution leads to new imbalances that we must not only anticipate, but actively address. UNESCO's work on digital governance for sustainable development at large is guided by our Internet Universality Framework and Rome Principles that underlines the need for rights-based, open, 
accessible and multi-stakeholder shaped governance for emerging technologies. This approach applies not only to questions of governance, but also to questions of access to information. It's our responsibility to ensure open access to information as a fundamental human right, especially in the context of COVID-19. The Collective for Artificial Intelligence against COVID-19's ambition is to do just this, fight the COVID-19 pandemic by addressing correlated challenges, too much data, too little coordination, and clear success factors and information silos. To do this, the CIIC will focus on three areas, tracking and tracing of contagion chains, targeting support for marginalized groups, and third, addressing the infodemic that has accompanied the pandemic. This is essential as falsehoods and misinformation impede access to trustworthy sources and reliable information and have proven deadly sowing confusion about life-saving personal and responses to the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, to harness the power of artificial intelligence, collective intelligence and augmented intelligence to, com to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, UNESCO is pleased to join the advisory committee alongside the UN Global Pulse and World Bank, among other partners, to support the launch of the CIIC that has mobilized support and participation from academia and the private sector. In this framework, UNESCO is mobilizing its network of experts, category two centers and institutions in order to ensure reinforced global cooperation to harness digital technologies to effectively combat the infodemic. In closing, I would like to underline reinforced global digital cooperation in the field of human rights and ethics is necessary to ensure the development of an artificial intelligence that is not only harnessed to ensure sustainable development, but is developed in a sustainable and ethical manner accessible to all. We look forward in the framework of the CIIC to working with all partners to ensure that this vision of artificial intelligence is a reality and translating ethical principles into practice and life-saving interventions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Moaz. We really appreciate your support and UNESCO support for Kayak. Now we have a presentation and demonstration on the Kayak platform by Cyrus Hodas, the chair of the AI initiative at the Future Society, and Ahmed Mostak, the founder of Stability.ai. Cyrus and Ahmad, please go ahead. Thank you, Mike, um, and thank you, Pepe, for, for, for hosting us, and thanks, everyone, for, for listening and uh, supporting Kayak. Um, I am going to give you a, a brief overview of what Kayak is, together with my uh, colleague, uh, Emma Musake, at uh, stability.ai. Uh, to step back a bit and uh, see where uh, this initiative comes from, we have to go back to the exercise that is being conducted currently at the United Nations on the global data access framework. Uh, this notion of sharing data for the greater good, uh, that's an exercise that we've been uh, involved with uh, UN Global Pulse and, uh, and many partners uh, present today. Um, uh, we are sharing a, a framework for, um, for, the, for, the, for data sharing uh, that will feed into the CAC exercise. So, so this is a foundational piece of this exercise. Another one is the one that uh, Butena uh, and, um, and, uh, and Moise mentioned, which is the, the UN uh, Roadmap for Digital Cooperation uh, and the work that the World Bank is doing also on establishing data as public goods to get to the, to the SDGs. Um, it's also building on the work and research that stability.ai has been conducting on the complex systems and using this knowledge graph into, into the exercise against uh, COVID-19. Uh, also building on the realization that big data is indeed a reality and uh, becoming more and more of an issue in tackling COVID-19. We have uh, many bottom-up initiatives that are coming creating uh, lots of data lakes, but they are not very useful without, uh, without context. Uh, realizing this lack of connectivity uh, between data and solutions around COVID-19 and the need for continuous gap analysis, uh, these silos that Butena was mentioning. Let me share a slide uh, to show you a bit.
So this is based on this various data sets that we are going to, to work on. So obviously we're working on structured data using uh, NLP and, and other systems that uh, Emma is gonna dig. Uh, really a holistic exercise. And by holistic exercise, we mean um, we are tackling data from various sources, whether it's healthcare, scientific research data, whether it's social data, whether it's economic and financial data, the idea is to address really the, the entirety of the cycle, getting us ready, getting us prepared to avoid future, future cycle eventually, but so going to the full uh, cycle, the, the full recovery cycle of the crisis. Um, so realizing that to get out of this crisis, we need a truly holistic solution uh, to take into account expert opinion in this various fields. Uh, we, uh, together with uh, Stanford uh, High, have decided to gather partners, uh, starting with the United Nations, Global Pulse, and UNESCO, and with the support of the private sector. Um, I give the floor to Emma, who's going to dig into uh, the platform and give you a bit of uh, uh, an example on these three use cases that we are starting working on we, in collaboration with uh, WHO and our UN partners. Hey, thanks, Cyrus. Uh, thank you, everyone, for diving in. I know that times are super busy and very strange indeed. I think um, we're faced with unprecedented issues, um, and many of our systems, our artificial intelligence, our human intelligence, is used to when the future is somewhat like the past and things are relatively certain. Um, when we kind of paddle into the unknown and kind of looking for a map, we need to have something to anchor ourselves. And so as Cyrus has mentioned and many others on the call as well, we've all been bending our wills and our power and everything we can towards this one issue that's united us. How do we solve COVID-19 on a healthcare basis, an economic basis and increasingly a social basis? It does not seem like it's gonna go away. Um, we've been dealing with this in our communities. We've been dealing with this internationally. And what we've seen and where we hope that Kayak will come in and help is to help structure and bring together some of these bottom-up initiatives by providing the context. Because we've all seen the issues with data and information. And we're all kind of wondering, how do we make that in a structured way through to knowledge, insights, and sense-making when faced with a problem that goes beyond our borders? It isn't enough for just half the nations of the world to do this. All 150 odd nations of the world have to have this capability and capacity something that Bithena picked up on at the World Bank with their initiatives on infrastructure and that all of us would like. So to that end, we decided to look at how can we take these data, structured and unstructured, and start putting that structure around it to deal with specific use cases. So the previous slide that Cyrus showed, um, Cyrus, can you go back one slide? I'm going to take over the computer to show a demo. Um, this consists of questions that have been asked by our partners. So we see the different types of interventions on the health, social, and economic side. And they go throughout the intervention life cycle because these will last for the next couple of years. We're already seeing the bailouts happening. We're seeing domestic international travel restrictions. We're seeing countries come out of the first wave and maybe not even exited at all. So to this end, we decided we need to create a resource that had three components. It needed to be authoritative, comprehensive, and up to date. And that's impossible from computers alone, and it's impossible from humans alone. But right now, we have the ability to have a large amount of technology and a large amount of human firepower to go through this. We started with three core use cases, tracking and tracing of contagion chains, the infodemic slash disinfodemic, as UNESCO would like to put it, and targeted aid for areas and groups in need. Through interviews with our partners and other experts in these fields to define the structure of knowledge around this to define what the known knowns are, what the known unknowns are, the key questions these experts were asking and knew how to get to an answer for, and then to hopefully move towards the unknown unknowns, the gap analysis that Cyrus was mentioning, because this disease and its impacts have really thrown us for six in terms of a lot of the um, various implements and other things. Uh, Cyrus, can you unshare your screen for a moment so I can share my screen? So what we've created is a knowledge graph architecture that can have multiple interfaces uh, to it. So we're gonna share one of the interfaces 
which is through our partners at Axis, um, who have a wonderful system, um, whereby you can look visually at the interactions between the various elements. So let's start at contact tracing or exposure notification, as it were. Um, within this exercise, through a combination of humans and data mining, we've identified over 100 different contact tracing initiatives. And we've seen that these have been implemented uh, both digitally and physically at various levels of success um, throughout various countries. The key element for contact tracing in uh, our opinion and the informed opinion from the expert interviews and discussions with decision makers and stakeholders is comprehensiveness and being up to date because nobody knows what will work. We have seen discussions from kind of Bluetooth and individual apps to, for example, the Google Apple um, Alliance for the APIs. We've seen this used, for example, within the Corona Y, the Corona Warn application within Germany. We've seen it potentially being used within the NHS. This knowledge graph output, um, which contains 65 key entities at various levels, so each one of these leads to another entity, um, allows for focus and kind of notifications of how these various elements develop, as well as the various contexts, such as the Bluetooth, for example, and other parts there. We hope that over time, this will get both broader and deeper and more structured, whereby you can see actual weightings, which is so important to augmented and artificial intelligence solutions, such as the NHS contact tracing app, having originally been on Bluetooth and now shifting towards using the global Google Apple Entity Alliance. However, it's not enough just to have another database of information sources and other things. And again, this is just one of the interfaces that we're building, as well as natural language interfaces where questions can be asked, building on some of the fantastic work around the COVID-19 data set and others, and automated brief generation. Um, you also need to be able to show the provenance. You need to be authoritative. So for example, within the COVID-19 pandemic, we can look at for example, the monitoring and countering of this pandemic. So as mentioned, we have been doing expert interviews and we've been identifying the key questions such as what is the various social media companies doing and their various policies that can be automatically generated and interrogated by this. But we've also been absorbing data beyond the interviews that we've been doing. So as an example of that, you can see this quote by Dr. David Nabarro on the right hand side. Um, this is from the WHO Infidemiology Conference, which was fantastic on the 29th of June, whereby you really kind of dug down. So our system automatically transcribed that, annotated it through named entity recognition, and then humans extracted these various elements. So if I click on this link here, it goes directly to the point in his speech that this quote came out. And we hope to have this backlinking capability through all the structured data that we have, as well as linking to the plurality of data sets and the fantastic data collectives, such as those by our partners at C3AI with their data lake, for example. Um, unfortunately, I think um, we have to make sure the governance for this is incredibly tight as well. And so I said, I can just pass it over to you to discuss some of the elements around that. Um, yes, is this uh, it's a big in-depth here. Uh, just, just a note that to, to, to mention, as I was mentioning at the beginning, that this is built on the the work that is done globally around um, trustworthy AI, around the data sharing uh, framework. So this is very much building on the work that IEEE has been doing, the OECD or uh, AI principles have been laid out there, the work that UNESCO is doing on the ethics of AI. So, so there is a, a solid foundation around trustworthy AI upon which we're building the system. Um, to, to, to wrap up, uh, I would like to, to say that we are moving from short-term tactical solutions uh, to uh, needing a long-term view, a long-term approach, a strategic approach, and the tools that support that. And we believe we, we have the tools in our hands and we are uh, with the right partners, uh, in particular, thanking uh, here the, the Patrick McGovern Foundation helping us there, but also our partners present today, such as uh, Edelman, Covington, C3.ai, and Element AI, and thanking them for, for the long-term vision in supporting Kayak. Um, we are looking forward to working with you uh, into defeating uh, COVID-19 together. Thank you very much for this. And we have a short two minute uh, video to show you now. Yes, I think the, uh, thank you, Cyrus. The topic of the video is really kind of, let's call government this together. So we are building this on open source principles, such as those espoused by UNESCO and many of the other partners here. 
And, you know, the more people that come in on this and augment the various parts as we move from collective intelligence to increasingly augmented intelligence, I believe we can build a framework that can deal with the multivariate crises here in a really holistic way. So let me share this video now. COVID-19 is a new threat to humanity. There are no local cures. It's a truly global crisis. Across the world, unemployment is soaring. Schools are closed. Essential supply chains are broken. Misinformation is everywhere. Everyone is affected. We need a holistic response. We need to know what works. But our knowledge is fragmented. It's scattered across the world. Siloed in government bodies, companies, universities, and hospitals. We at Kayak are building a living knowledge map. We're connecting these disparate parts together. This map is assembled from our collective intelligence, and it combines human expertise and big data. Augmented intelligence will reduce the time from insight to impact. Decision makers will be able to make better decisions faster. The knowledge gap will be solved, showing us how to safely open schools, how to guarantee incomes and secure food. This map can only be as good as the people who shape it. We need expertise and data. We need political will and capital to make this happen. Join us. Together we can defeat COVID. Thank you, Cyrus and Amad, for that introduction of Kayak Platform. Now I'd like to turn to Bernardo Mariano Jr., the Chief Information Officer at the World Health Organization. Bernardo, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me here. Um, I also want to pay my tribute to all the affected communities in this world, as well as all the frontline workers that every day and night, they give the best of themselves to save the world and save the world. A collaborative framework such as Kayak will allow us to bring the best of each one of us, to contribute to that transformation, the global transformation of healthcare sector, the much needed transformation of healthcare sector. But let's not forget as we drive or navigate or go through that journey of a digital transformation of healthcare sector, Half of the world does not have access to digital technologies. They don't have access to broadband. So let's leave no one behind. Digital technologies like AI, big data, machine learning hold a promise to transform the healthcare sector. And but also let's not forget that the healthcare sector is traditionally siloed. So therefore, there's a lot of work on the policy level, regulations, in addition to digital technologies to really bring the impact that we need in that digital transformation of the healthcare sector to deliver that objective that, that we all have in mind, which is the health for all, the sustainable development goal. At WHO, we have a triple billion target goal to make sure that uh, that's part of our strategy to ensure that as we deliver that, those, those triple billion targets, uh, we bring and contribute to that sustainable development goal, which is health for all. Let me deliberate in three areas as we move uh, in, into, into this collaborative uh, framework. First of all, how COVID is increasing the use of digital, such as this meeting. We are here uh, uh, meeting virtually. So there's a paperless, there's a travel-less, and there is a virtual uh, encounters and meetings. So the novelty of coronavirus has led this rapid generation of uh, findings in using digital solutions. But also, I wanted to also deliberate a little bit on guiding principle 
artificial intelligence based solutions. And the third area we deliberate is on the multilateral collaboration. So digital technologies are used to assist population screening, track infections, monitor resources, to define social determinants of health, and on and on, including finding fundamentals from equity human rights elements as we fight COVID-19. As the technology itself holds a huge potential for to deliver very good and positive health outcomes, we must also leave space to discuss the real life ethical questions surrounding its use. We must ensure that they are used correctly and the healthcare systems are particularly accessible and equitable and also ensure patients' privacy and safety. At WHO, we play a very, very important, uh, important uh, um, attention to ensure that the right balance between delivering the positive health outcomes, but also protecting the citizens on ethics, privacy, and security to ensure that has we go around using the data where two sectors come, when one sector, which is a life science that is used to donate, donate blood, donate organs, donate uh, for the greater good, to help somebody, and the tech sector, which is used to, to, to monetize data, how can we conceal these two? So as we, as we navigate through that journey, uh, especially under the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We also we recently issued an ethical consideration guide, guidance to use digital proximity track, those proximity tracking technologies for COVID-19 and contact tracing, because many member states are navigating that journey of contact tracing tools, uh, and we want to ensure that uh, they have the right advice, the appropriate guidance to make, make, make the best out of these contact tracing tools. We're also working with a number of member states to explore uh, uh, the acceleration of telehealth and telemedicine. That's a potential that, the, that the countries can use to really address the challenges around health uh, systems, strengthening and health, health system availability as, in, as in the case of uh, COVID-19. We also launched recently a digital solution clearinghouse and we're working together with a number of partners, including UNESCO on infodemic management. So that's the other uh, area that, uh, that is emerging. The second consideration I wanna to just describe a little bit and, and then perhaps uh, uh, bring to the fore is this guiding principle around artificial intelligence-based solutions. Let's make sure and this is something that, the, that, the, that the, as we discussed with the member states, we want to ensure that it is, it is equitable and is accessible. We want to ensure that the, the interplay with AI and digital divide does not create or does not widen that digital divide. We want to preserve individual rights, autonomy, privacy, informed consent, and not just one consent is a dynamic consent and freedom of bias from end discrimination. The other principle we want to ensure that, that uh, AI have is education, how the AI make these devices make the decisions, how well, we can make sure that we catch any uh, wrong decision that might have human uh, life impact in the long run. Of course, maintaining the human control of AI is key and strengthening the public oversight and regulation, it's also key. Ultimately, the value of artificial intelligence will depend on how it can contribute to narrow that digital divide, which is a challenge, but we are there to work with all partners to overcome that challenge and making sure that the health for all is a key milestone that we deliver uh, uh, at the end of 2030. 
Let me go to the multilateral cooperation. During the World Health Assembly 73 uh, and this year, countries called us to leverage on digital technologies to respond for COVID-19, including for addressing not only health, but also socioeconomic impact. This pandemic is showing that uh, public health, social uh, impact, as well as economic impact are so intertwined that uh, a decision on one impact the other and the world needs the best of each one of us in these three areas to make sure that we, as a global community, we deliver the best services to, to the world population. So therefore, it is very critical to improve knowledge transfer and efficiency out of this overwhelming information that we have to make sure that we timely support countries making the right decision at the right time. So a multilateral stakeholder engagement such as IAC has the potential to enable the generation of a comprehensive and, and interoperable knowledge to capture the best practices while taking into consideration elements such as language, culture, economic, social, and local impact. Therefore, let's work together. Let's promote solidarity using Dr. Tedros' word. Solidarity is key, kindness, and together, togetherness. Thank you. Thank you, Bernardo, for sharing how the WHO is employing digital technologies to address this crisis, and also for that important reminder about the need to bridge the digital divide in our work. Now I'd like to introduce Richard Edelman, the CEO of Edelman, who's going to give us a presentation on building multi-stakeholder trust. Okay, good morning um, to all of you. I want to try to frame this um, on the basis that the coronavirus will only be managed if we can fight infodemic. Um, yesterday, Axios talked about an infodemic of misinformation and disinformation that's crippling the response to coronavirus. Um, two quick statistics. 38% of Americans surveyed by Pew in June said that compared to the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, it's harder to identify what's true and what's false about the virus. Also, one third of Americans uh, said that they will not get a coronavirus vaccine if such is available because they think it might be dangerous. Just to give you some sense of why this matters. Okay, so we have been studying trust for 20 years. And we study trust in business, government, NGOs, and media. And we study it across 28 countries. Traditionally, we just do this in time for Davos. This year, we also decided to do one in May. And the specific reason why is that um, so many moving plates between the murder of George Floyd and the um, globalization of the COVID epidemic. So let me just quickly get into the data. Next slide, please. We study um, people who are college plus educated. We also study those who are just mass population. Um, and so this field work was done at the end of April. Next slide. Here's what we found. It was an interesting change uh, from, from even January. We saw that uh, trust actually went up in institutions, but next slide, please. Um, it basically went up mostly because of a huge jump in trust in government. Government has never been the most trusted institution. Government moved to the fore in the period March, April, May. We, however, believe that that has now shifted back to business in the front um, and that indeed we are gonna see quite quickly um, business reemerging as the most trusted government sinking. Next slide. These actually indicate that most big jumps in trust are trust bubbles, and that in fact, you don't get a solid kind of position of trust if you have a huge jump in one small period of time. Next slide. The key point is that the United States is the most divided country in the world. I just want you to appreciate the magnitude of that divide. Take a look at Democrats versus Republicans, on trust in federal government, 19 point gap, on trust in media, nearly a 30 point gap. What you appreciate from this is that in fact, the two traditional institutions that lead in an epidemic or a crisis, which are government 
and media, media to inform government to do um, in the United States, actually it's local government more than federal that is leading. Um, and in fact, media is actually partly uh, distrusted because of politics. Next slide. <clears throat> To appreciate the magnitude of change in attitude to government, people basically believe across the world that government can order lockdowns and also that government can take personal data if it's going to help and contain the spread of the virus. There is a developing country versus developed country split here. I want you to note that the UK is at the high at 59, all the rest of the developed countries are below. And in the developing market, uh, group, um, you see high of 91 in China, uh, down to uh, sort of Mexico at 68. Next slide. There is a dissatisfaction about the response to COVID in general with the government. It's about getting medical supplies and PPP. With business, it is protection of workers. I want to reiterate that the job of institutions is now inside out, that taking care of employees actually drives brand purchase. That is the first time we've ever seen that happen. <clears throat> Next slide. There is a deep desire for expertise. Doctors, scientists, national health officials. I do want you to note the drop in three months in the WHO trust. I'm glad that that uh, previous speaker went before me as opposed to after me. Um, but the relatively lower levels um, for journalists is problematic. But the need for the truth, people are desperately searching for. And in fact, sometimes companies are expected to fill the void of information to employees. Next, please. Here we go. Employers are supposed to give me information about where I can get tested, where I can't travel, how to stay healthy um, working remotely. Uh, so in fact, government does so much, media does so much, the void is filled by the private sector. Next, please. This slide is the money slide. The gap in trust between traditional media and social media is the largest ever. It's 25 points. And it's important because social is the first and only port of call for millennials in many cases. Uh, and if we are not putting quality information into the social context, then the information will simply be based on personal experience, disinformation, or ideology. And therefore, it is the responsibility of institutions to participate in social. It is good that traditional media exists and provides a sort of foundation point, but it's not sufficient. Next, please. Fake news. The problem of fake news is accelerating. In fact, we find that two thirds now believe that there's lots of fake news and false information about COVID and just about half the people find it impossible to find trustworthy information about the virus. Again, we have to get quality information out. We have to correct misperceptions. That's a function of frequency, who the spokesperson is, and making sure you correct falsehood. Next. I want you to see that NGOs play a vital role in this pandemic and also um, in, in this period of, of time as the last mile, in particular in delivering services uh, in lesser um, wealthy areas. Uh, and because they have credibility as we're not business, we're not government, we're the other, that matters. Um, and so NGOs have had a quite smart jump. I want you to understand that trust in NGOs was about 40% uh, in, in China and India until about five years ago. They were quite low. NGOs have really risen substantially in those markets. Next, please. There are major shifts in trust 
since the murder of George Floyd and the onset of COVID. In one year, we find a substantial change in why people buy products. After price, today it is whether you trust the company that owns the brand um, or that makes the product, you know, half the people buy a new brand because of that, more than uh, the customer service, more than access in retail, more than ingredients. Um, it is a major change in expectation of companies that brands will be expected to speak up on behalf of their customers in a concept that we call brand democracy. Belief-driven buyers are now three quarters of the total consuming public. And they say, I will only buy if the brand speaks up. Next, please. This is a very important slide. Historically, racial injustice has been the third rail when companies consider what to do in marketing. Today, if you speak up on racial injustice, you get between a two and a half and four times bigger jump in trust in the brand than in terms of loss of trust in the brand. So again, if you're a smart brand, you will, as Nike or Dove or others, speak up on behalf of Black Lives Matter and the necessity of ending systemic racism. Next slide. There is optimism about the long term. If the private sector in particular is committed to having a stakeholder view of the world instead of just a shareholder. So it's not all about negativity. Next, please. So let me try to conclude my presentation with three or four ideas. The first is that government, which has led in the response to COVID in the first three months, I believe is starting to ebb. It's starting to show um, signs of strain, of being nationalistic, populist, and frankly, not exactly transparent and in increasingly lacking in quality of information. Therefore, the private sector is going to have to step in and do more. That means CEOs demonstrating public leadership. Example, um, when a Ben and Jerry's decides that it's gonna hire people um, who have um, had misdemeanor terms in prison to work in their factories. That's a major step. Business and government have to work together on solutions. For example, we're doing voluntary work for the city of Chicago. We've proposed a concept called safety check so that when you go to a restaurant or a hotel, you know that there's a protocol for cleaning, also for how workers are being tested, and in fact, a temperature check at the front door for a restaurant. And lastly, we've got to have collaboration instead of arguing among institutions. We don't have the time for fights. Um, people just want results. And so again, trust is very um, uncertain at the moment. There's a lot of movement among the institutions, but the thing that comes clearest is we're in a battle for truth and we're only gonna win if we get to quality information and people can make good decisions about wearing masks, about behaving properly in this period of time. So thank you all very much for having me. Thank you, Richard, for sharing those important insights from the trust barometer. It's clear that public trust is gonna be critical to our efforts to control this pandemic. Uh, at this like, point, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for uh, sharing their insights with us this morning. We're going to take a short break and come back in a few minutes with a panel discussion from some of the kayak participating organizations. Welcome back to the official launch of Kayak. We had a series of very interesting presentations in the first half of this event. And now at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Will Knight, who will moderate a panel discussion among some of the kayak participating organizations. Will, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you very much. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me to do this. Um, so let me just quickly introduce our panelists. We have uh, a great lineup here today for everybody. We have, um, first of all, Sasha Bell, who's Program Specialist for Digital Innovation at UNESCO. Robert Kirkpatrick, Director of UN Global Pulse. 
we have Yoshi Benjo, who's a co-founder of Element AI, and of course, one of the, um, the famous, uh, I should say, godfathers of, of deep learning and, and modern AI. Um, we also have Lee Tiedrich, uh, partner at Covington and Berling. And finally, but not least, Andrew Zoli, who's vice president of Global Impact for Planet. So welcome, everybody. Please uh, turn on your cameras. Thank you. Awesome. Excellent. Great to see you all. Thank you so much. Um, let's just, just kick off with, uh, I think, the, the sort of big question here and the a big question that I have as someone who covers AI, which is, you know, what has AI done for us so far in the fight against COVID? And I think what else, you know, what else can we hope that it's going to do? I guess maybe also for, for future pandemics or crises such as this. And I'd like to ask Yoshio, who's the person I know best, but also as one of the big names in AI, just what, what he would say. Um, I, I don't think I, I can really uh, give justice to your question. I've been involved in a few projects and, and I know there are a lot of things, but um, um, so, so my knowledge is uh, very superficial of these other areas. Uh, uh, so one of the things that, one of the first applications of AI that came early in the pandemic has been um, the application of deep learning and medical imaging um, using, trying to predict the presence of the disease of given CT scans and, and other um, medical imaging. So that was using fairly standard existing techniques. Um, there's a, uh, uh, an area that I'm uh, very much involved in, which uh, I think is still in, the, in, in, in its beginnings, uh, but has a lot of potential uh, and a lot of effort is going on around the world. And that is for antiviral drug discovery. So here, uh, well, clearly we need something like this to get out of this crisis. Uh, I mean, um, uh, just to put things in perspective, the, um, if, if we had a vaccine, of course, that would be the ideal situation, but it might take a while before we have enough certainty that the particular vaccine is safe. And so if we could have um, uh, drugs, especially drugs that have already been tested for toxicity, uh, that maybe combined uh, two or three drugs together um, to uh, give us a treatment for those who are most at risk, that would be a, a you know, big progress to reduce mortality. Uh, and so there is uh, work going on where we use machine learning uh, to predict what would be the effect of uh, two or three drugs together based on, well, uh, initial data that is coming on some of those pairs, but there's just too many pairs to try them out. And that's why we need machine learning to make guesses about those pairs. Uh, what's nice is that you can also use all kinds of other data about uh, the individual drugs and how they interact with uh, different uh, genes, different proteins, how the uh, proteins themselves interact with each other and so on. So there's a, a lot of medical information that can be brought in with graph neural nets. Another uh, approach that uh, I'm also involved in is the discovery of, of completely new molecules. Um, so there you're looking at a much bigger space. Uh, the disadvantage is now we would have to test those molecules for toxicity in humans in a more serious way, but uh, the potential for uh, therapeutic impact is, is greater. So here again, the problem is, uh, well, the number of potential molecules is too, is too big and the traditional pipeline for discovering drugs is just too slow. Like we can't wait five years or 10 years for this to happen. And so the idea is to use machine learning, reinforcement learning, uh, active learning in order to search that space very, very efficiently using, um, uh, physical simulations of docking between a, a, a candidate molecule and a target protein um, to uh, sort of pre-screen and, and also provide a large amount of, uh, of data for training the model because the actual amount of data you'll get from the number of actually tested molecules is going to be tiny. And so, uh, you know, you need to have strategies to deal with that. Um, another area I've been involved with regards epidemic modeling and, and digital tracing. So there's uh, uh, already a bunch of uh, epidemiological models, but um, um, they usually uh, make very, very strong assumptions and uh, not work at the individual level. But if you want to test policies like what would happen if people behave in such and such a way? Or uh, what if the government or local government decides to 
uh, ask people to act in such and such a way uh, and people act in such and such a way, what would be, according to the best uh, medical knowledge today, what would be the outcome? So here is really a mix of uh, medical knowledge, uh, epidemiological models and, and machine learning to try to learn good policies and do a good job of modeling what the effects of people acting in such and such way would be uh, so that we can inform public health. And potentially this kind of thing can be used if we look at individual uh, information available on phones uh, for things like uh, digital tracing or for uh, using information about symptoms that people may self-report in order to guide their behavior. So uh, there's a lot more uh, that is going on. Uh, uh, there's some nice NLP work that uh, is going on that uh, I, I can talk about. Uh, we call this infodemic. So we have the actual virus uh, uh, going loose, but there's also a lot of false information going around the web. And uh, we could use machine learning to detect these uh, fake news, which can really have a drastic negative impact on, on people. So that's uh, another area. I know there's also a bunch of other projects involving predicting um, uh, the need for ICUs, uh, depending on patient profile, uh, and also predicting uh, healthcare demand. Like uh, one of the problems with healthcare systems is that they, they, uh, this you know, rapid uh, uh, break, uh, breakout of uh, uh, requiring more people uh, in some places and less people in other places. So how can we like, predict um, the needs so that we can allocate the resources in the right. Mm -hmm. I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. I know there's a lot going on, obviously. And um, I, we're going to talk a bit about some of these different sources of data and why it's important to, to really think about that. Um, but I love the example of, of um, you know, modeling people's behavior and how that affects, you know, the economic situation, the, the spread of the yep. virus. Um, I just want to bring in Andrew because obviously mm -hmm. he's, his company is doing some interesting stuff with um, data that people might not immediately associate with the pandemic. So, Andrew, tell us a bit about that. Well, thanks, Will. I really appreciate it. And, and to build on on uh, uh, on the prior comments, I think uh, first of all, just a quick note: our organization, Planet, has deployed the largest constellation of Earth observing satellites in history, and we image the entire planet every day in relatively high resolution. And then we have a, a separate group of satellites that can do it in extremely high resolution down under you know, about 50 centimeters. And that's important and valuable as a data set uh, because uh, all public health outbreaks, all public health, every, everything, all, all aspects of public health have very strong spatial and temporal characteristics. Where people are living and how closely they're living with each other and, and uh, what are the kind of patterns of behavior all shape how uh, every disease, and we're not just talking about COVID, but malaria and electric, uh, you know, ne uh, neglected tropical diseases and, and countless others. Um, there are also uh, numerous things that are happening that are uh, the adjacent things that are happening to COVID. So that, you know, COVID has an effect on whether or not farmers can get out and uh, uh, work in their fields. And that turns out to be critically important in a, in a country, in a, in a region, for instance, where 80% of the the food is grown by smallholder farmers, for instance, in, in East Africa, where there's also a locust infestation. We have to be able to understand the connection between COVID and food security and the way in which they amplify each other. So we're using the satellite imagery and the tools of machine learning and computer vision and the kinds of statistical and deep learning um, uh, uh, modeling that, that, uh, that Yusha mentioned a, a moment ago. Uh, to do really four or five things. The first one is to inform spatially explicit epidemiological models of the spread of the disease. The second is to monitor those places that are at high risk to try and help identify how various risk factors are evolving. The third one is to coordinate response, to be able to identify and find pockets and communities, particularly of, of poor and vulnerable people. And sometimes those people are not on the map. So for instance, uh, we take all of our satellite imagery and working with partners, we extract uh, roads and buildings analyses so that we can identify pockets of people who might be underserved or might not be currently you know, on the map. And then finally, uh, uh, the last two things we're doing are monitoring the recovery, which is a little early now because we're, we're not there yet. And, and looking at these ancillary forms of, of change. Now, I can tell you about one, uh, specific application that shows how these parts come together. 
Um, we're working with a couple of public health organizations that have developed field-based mobile tools to guide public health workers in the field to these locations. And it's all informed by geospatial data that's been analyzed with these tools of, of AI, machine learning, uh, and, and kind of related, uh, related techniques. The field work that then goes on as those health workers go out in the field and collect that information and actually engage in public health interventions comes back as a data set to improve and inform the model. So every observation and every action that's taken by a public health worker should make our AI models better. And our improved AI models should in turn, uh, th these data-driven models help more efficiently drive uh, uh, the, the behavior of these public health workers. And all of that is designed to accelerate the, um, uh, and, to, and to diminish the amount of time between when we actually get vaccines and therapeutics, the kinds of molecules that, that Yoshua was mentioning, and the time that everybody can get them. That, that's the window where, where today we don't have those indications, but soon we will, and knock wood. And if, as soon as we do, we wanna make sure everybody on earth gets them. And, and these tools are gonna to be essential for making sure that happens. So I just wanna bring in Sasha to, to talk about why, you know, this initiative generally, why it's so important to bring all these different data sets together and what, what the hope is to, what, what, what um, the initiative hopes that scientists will be able to sort of tackle using this data uh, through this initiative. So Sasha, why don't you take that? Thank you very much, Will, for that question. I'd like to reflect on what Joshua is saying as it concerns uh, how to use AI to speed up the discovery of new drugs, because actually the same kind of challenge exists right now as it concerns decision-making. So decisions that were previously, uh, we had months to do due diligence and decide on, now need to be taken in a matter of days. Uh, but this is extremely challenging because there's increasing uncertainty, there's lack of clear evidence, there's difficulty to identify best practices, and there's also challenging trade-offs going on, particularly as it concerns debates with regards to human rights and ethics in the field of data protection, access to information, and freedom of expression, as we heard with regards to disinformation, which is really accompanying the pandemic and what UNESCO calls a disinfodemic, which is just as deadly or more deadly as the virus itself. So there are lots of conflicting incentives here, and how to make these informed decisions is no easy task. Uh, I was talking to colleagues earlier today, we were saying, you know, the catchphrase should be uh, too much information and too little time. Uh, and this is really a huge question that we have in the face of uh, thinking about developing kayak in the conversations that we have with the different partners is how do we make a global impact with AI tools that is a, uh, takes into consideration scalable approaches for data, model and code sharing, adapting applications to local contexts, but also in reflecting on what the UN Secretary General just recently underlined in the launch of his digital cooperation roadmap, how do we ensure uh, reinventing multilateral cooperation and cooperation across borders that turns insight and information into action and knowledge. But there are lots of challenges. Uh, one is too much data. The second is too little coordination, unclear success factors, and information silos. So what are the key questions that from our perspective at UNESCO, we hope this data may help scientists answer? For us, there are three major ones. The first is, how do we overcome the hyper-fragmentation of data sharing efforts? And we see the risk right now that results in advances that are restricted to particular projects in local communities that aren't able to be shared in a global way and be scaled up. So this means that uh, model and code sharing, for example, could accelerate the development and dissemination of new applications. So at this stage, what we see, despite the proliferation of a lot of really interesting initiatives in this field, is the need to develop a truly global, open, comprehensive, and comparable and verified data sharing initiative in order to connect and promote cooperation between disparate communities and geographies. But here I'd like to underline also different stakeholder groups. And this is something that we see as a strength in kayak. The second challenge is looking at how COVID related challenges are interlinked. And I love Andrew, what you said earlier when you were talking about how uh, you identified in your work the interlinkages of uh, thematic areas that unfortunately because of the knowledge silos that exist in, in the public and the private sector are often considered as uh, not interlinked. So we need to really understand through data-driven policy making and help scientists understand the link between the health, the economic, and the social impacts, among others, of this pandemic. 
the third aspect is really looking at what are the best practices that exist to inform scalable data-driven policymaking and programmatic intervention. And here there are several levels that uh, we see as an added value of Kaya. The first, of course, is technical. So how do we use AI to ingest and process information by technologies like NLP? The second is how to move from data to information, to collective intelligence, to knowledge, to insights, to, and to sense making. Uh, at UNESCO, we understand access to information to be a fundamental human right, but we also see access to knowledge as something correlated to this. And you'll see that in the MVPs that Kayak has placed an emphasis on. Uh, many of you are familiar with them, but the first is tracking and tracing of contagion chains. The second is targeting support for marginalized groups. And the third is addressing the infodemic. And here I'd just like to close by specifically because this is dear to UNESCO's work, uh, talking about what we hope uh, Kayak will provide to scientists, but also to different stakeholder groups as it concerns insights to how to effectively combat the infodemic. So the first is identifying types and sources of misinformation and disinformation. The second is looking at making sense of existing initiatives at fighting the infodemic and making sure that there's a platform in place in order to scale up solutions like fact checking that are working. So providing best practice examples that can be scaled and that are open and accessible. And the last is looking at helping policymakers build systems to counter the infodemic. So there's the important work of civil society and academia. There's also the important work of public policies and, and UNESCO, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, has been working very actively to provide policy briefs and frameworks to address the disinfodemic specifically. Excellent, that's really interesting. I, yeah, I think that the, it, it's um, you know, amazing at a time when technology in a way is kind of pushing countries in, in different directions. Um, this, is, this is a really great example of our opportunity countries potentially to, to have to work together. I wonder if Robert, do you want to add, um, you know, build on, on what Sasha was saying perhaps a little bit? Yeah, no, I, I think it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's an ambitious project that I think, you know, is, is focusing on some very key areas that if, if they can uh, be addressed, they're going to have a really, really big impact. I mean, I think this is, uh, there's a huge signal to noise problem right now in the world as, as people are trying to make decisions. And there are vast amounts of data out there that aren't being tapped and aren't being leveraged um, in ways that they could be to, to fill some of these information gaps. I think, you know, we've seen, I mean, there, there are clearly opportunities around outbreak detection as well as outbreak prediction. Uh, people are talking about information anecdotally uh, you know, I heard there's a report, you know, here I heard people are in this village are sick. I mean, we've been in uh, in our lab in Uganda, for example, using speech recognition in several indigenous Ugandan languages to listen to conversations on uh, talk radio programs where people are calling in and saying, I heard there's something happened in this village. Or people are saying there's no food in the grocery stores and we're going to have to leave the cities and go into the, into the bush. Um, you know, the amount of disinformation that you can spot out there is, is quite significant. Um, you know, I think there are some very interesting um, opportunities around the socioeconomic impact analysis. I mean, the, and, and this is not just about thinking about the longer term impact on progress toward the sustainable development goals. It actually applies to the health emergency. You know, the, se the secretary general has called for solidarity, um, global solidarity in the face of this pandemic, but that, that notion of solidarity applies down to the household level because the degree to which individuals understand their responsibility for protecting the health and safety of their neighbors determines um, you know, whether they comply with these kinds of measures. Um, so their understanding and their perceptions and the degree to which they're informed matters, but also if we can use, for example, uh, analysis of anonymized financial transactions or mobile phone, mobile money transactions, to understand where people are suffering from the impacts disproportionately relevant relative to others, that creates an opportunity um, to be able to see, well, these are people who are least likely to be able to afford to comply with lockdowns. These are, these are populations where you might want to have conditional cash transfers, mobile money transfers um, targeted as a priority to help them coast through and also maintain lockdowns. So it, it's, uh, it, there, there, there are many kinds of sources of data out there um, that I think could be turned into very, very powerful solutions when combined with, um, you know, deep learning and other uh, AI techniques. 
um, you know, understanding the functioning of the healthcare system, where people reporting this kind of information again, and the disinformation that we've seen um, in that field as well. So I think we're very, very keen to uh, to see uh, this effort get off the ground. I think uh, it has it has tremendous potential um, to support decision making uh, by scientists and by potentially by policymakers and in terms of the areas that they're pursuing. Um, uh, I think there are also, you know, as, as we think about this, there are longer term questions about this kind of capability in general. This isn't the last crisis of this type we're going to see. Um, and thinking about how we can be more resilient, how we can leverage collective intelligence and artificial intelligence together, um, you know, more effectively in the future is something that's going to be really important. Great point. Yeah, when you mentioned um, using anonymized financial records, it, I mean, I, th I totally agree. It seems like a very um, a smart way to kind of model some of these factors. But there's obviously a difference between sort of you know what's possible and what what should be done and, and what's possible given the you know the kind of ethical challenges. It makes me think of the the controversies around things like contract tracing, right? Which in theory could help spot could prevent the, the spread of the disease, but a lot of people took issue with the privacy um, implications. So I want to bring in um, Lee here, just um, as, as someone who has looked at and looks at the ethical side of AI, as well as some of the, you know, the kind of re regulatory issues, and just to talk about what, what the issues will be in this case, especially bringing together lots of different data sources in different um, countries, different regions. Yeah, well, I think one of the keys for making any type of data initiative successful in addressing some of the important issues that Sasha and others have raised is having a good data governance um, or management structure. And there are a lot of different components of that. And I'll just focus on three um, to kick us off. I mean, the first is, is all the other panelists have mentioned, um, what Kayak seeks to do is bring together data from diverse sources. So, you know, step one is we need to come up with some sort of data standardization to create data interoperability because not everybody maintains their data in the same format. So we need to make sure that if people desire to share it, that they can, can use that. Um, second big key element is dealing with, I call data labeling um, or rights management and tracking the provenance and lineage of the data. And that's important for several reasons. You know, we talked about um, using anonymized uh, customer data in, in the financial services context, and you want to make sure you comply with privacy regimes when you're using the data. Also, some of the data may be subject to contractual restrictions, so you need a way to kind of track um, what the data is to make sure that the uses comply with applicable legal contractual requirements, and then also make sure um, picking up on Sasha's disinformation point that the data is reliable for the purpose that's intended. If you're using it in connection with some of the research that uh, Yosha described, you want to make sure it's appropriate for that uh, purpose. And then the final um, point I'll just make with respect to data governance is you want to make sure that the data is in an entrusted environment. Um, obviously, uh, security is a key aspect of that because if the data is manipulated um, and is no longer reliable, that's gonna, gonna cause problems. If people are, and this is something we, we work with organizations with all the time, if people are gonna be exchanging data, you wanna have a reliable contractual structure or rights management structure for the exchange of data. And then, you know, monitoring the use, think things along those elements. So. Um, data management, uh, data governance, I think is really key. And those are some of the key elements of, of how I would go about doing that. You know, I want to come back to Yosha, who, who's someone who's, um, I've spoken to in the past about the kind of the international um, picture here, you know, the nature, there's this kind of great sense of rivalry, it seems right now about AI, especially, but other areas of technology. Um, and I'm curious if he is sort of this, gives him hope that there may be you know, a way for the scientists to build a bit more of a kind of global um, collaboration on, on some of these issues. And, and including, Lee, you know, when it comes to tackling some of these ethical questions, which is something I think she's talked about. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I'm very optimistic. I, I've seen um, a will to forget a little bit about ego and about who's going to get recognition and who's going to get funding. Um, and researchers and companies have been collaborating on a number of projects that uh, have 
I've seen uh, or been involved with uh, in the last few months because we all feel concerned and uh, it's like an emergency and it's not a matter of like uh, who's, who's going to be first or second in the author list, but uh, well, we actually need to solve this problem. And so this is very encouraging. Uh, I'm hoping that when we, uh, uh, you know, when this subsides uh, for one reason or another, um, we don't forget that ability that we have to work towards the common good in solidarity uh, rather than uh, have our little turf wars and uh, being protective of our institutions, our labs, our names and stuff. Um, so I think this is a, this is a good exercise. Hopefully um, people remember those lessons. Um, I think it's similar to the lessons that we can gather for the, the work in, in, in the coming years to, to deal with climate change where we have to go beyond our little uh, short-term objectives and our uh, usual incentives and, and think about the global picture and be willing to collaborate with respect to the, 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 the uh, for example, the SDGs that the UN uh, has put forward. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that the, there is something that has changed and now we should take advantage of this opportunity to create stronger international um, uh, ties between the, the researchers and the companies and, and the government uh, organizations. So I happen to be involved in a new initiative, um, the Global Panel on uh, Partnership on AI, um, which is a multi-government um, thing that just uh, started, was announced a few weeks ago, uh, involving like 25 countries already, where Canada and France have been leading the charge, but uh, many other countries are joined to try to coordinate AI, um, research, especially responsible AI, and also innovation, um, the ethical aspects, the data aspects, the uh, economic aspects, where I think really we, we all gain a lot if we can do a better job of uh, coordinating these governance and ethical and um, beneficial AI applications kind of projects. Yeah, that's, that's great. Well, um, you know, we're getting a little short on time, but I, I can see both Sasha and Robert um, nodding and I want to just you know what, what can the UN or UNESCO do here because it, it must be concerning somewhat to see the way um, some countries are, are turning turning against one another or creating these kind of enclaves so what, what do you how, how optimistic are you about that um, Sasha why don't you take that I'm very happy to follow what Joshua just said and, and also reflect on, on what you said Will in the beginning about rivalry because I think this is a a, a very dramatic misconception uh, that there is, for example, particularly at the multilateral level, the competition going on, for example, between UNESCO and the OECD and the European Commission and the Council of Europe and the African Union Working Group on AI, when in fact we talk to each other almost every day. Actually, I think the quarantine period will be the longest amount of time that I will go without seeing colleagues that are working on, on these issues. And I think also Kayak is proof that organizations like the WHO the World Bank, UN Global Pulse, and UNESCO, among others, can work uh, and reinvent what multilateral cooperation looks like, but also what multi-stakeholder cooperation looks like. So with the private sector, with civil society and academia, and very much look forward to supporting uh, Joshua's chairmanship uh, for the Working Group of Responsible AI in the framework of, of GPI, which was just officially launched this afternoon. I'd like to just uh, really briefly touch on uh, your question about um, how we approach data governance to talk specifically about and, and reflecting on what Lee said, which was absolutely excellent and, and very dear to the heart of UNESCO, is what can this initiative specifically teach us in the long term about ethical data governance? So there's uh, at the heart of a lot of this work, questions of ethics and human rights. And this is making the front page of newspapers on, on a daily basis. And you're also writing about this question, Will. And uh, I think here what, uh, what it underlines and what this cooperation underlines is that we can't afford to leave the questions of human rights and ethics as afterthoughts in the process of technological innovation, whose mission, as again, Yoshua Bengio often says, uh, is to reduce suffering and not increase it. And so we can come together around this common commitment to reduce suffering and use technology to reduce suffering to meet the sustainable development goals. 
kayak specifically reflecting on what Lee was saying earlier, builds on the global data access framework and the UN Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation, but it also builds on UNESCO's ongoing standard setting process to develop a recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence, and specifically a framework that we use that guides all of our work on digital governance, which highlights that AI and emerging technology at large should be governed by human rights, should be open, should be accessible, and should be multi-stakeholder. And this is absolutely essential in the framework of Kayak specifically, because there are questions that are coming up as it concerns, of course, the right to privacy, but also data protection, non-discrimination, as Robert mentioned earlier, because there are marginalized groups that are being targeted by increased hate speech online, uh, as well as the right to health. So this debate about, which is a fake debate in fact, uh, right to health, uh, right to privacy, uh, through initiatives like this, we can show that it's not an either or situation and that in fact, we can have efficient AI innovations that help with sustainable development and that are human rights based. Yeah, I, I can see. I'd like, I'd like to add something about this, which is interesting. So uh, I think uh, I totally agree that we, we want to find solutions that protect both say privacy and health and dignity. Uh, I would like, uh, but what's interesting is that it, uh, trying to find solutions that uh, manage to do a good job on all of these fronts require um, a lot of uh, creativity. I mean, there's a tension. There is the tension, you, you know, uh, say between privacy where you want less data and machine learning where you want more data. Uh, but there, you know, there are ways to uh, find the, you know, the better privacy communication model as well as the better machine learning approach what which which do the best compromise and this is also true for for dignity where we want to protect people's rights not to you know become victims um, mm -hmm. of uh, some, some sort of stigmatization uh, at the same time as we want to use as much information as possible to uh, protect people's health so uh, I, I think it is important to keep in mind that there are really interesting research questions to try to um, to to deal with all of these uh, tensions. Those tensions, yeah. Well, Andrew, quickly, was we running out of time? So just a quick. Uh, yeah, just thirty seconds on this. I, I think the the thing that the major institutions hold, like the UN, is they hold the frameworks and architectures of cooperation, and they hold the values that are universal values and the 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 essential role of of imparting and reinforcing and ensuring those values. But a lot of the assets here are actually in the private sector. And I, I think one of the things that's particularly fascinating here is to see the speed with which some very large and well uh, endowed both financially and from a data perspective, uh, institutions have been able to sort of spring forth in collaborations. Um, I think one of the things that is particularly interesting and might, and might be valuable for, for this moment is to determine the architectures by which we can leave much of that data private, but produce derivative privacy protecting uh, derivative assets that are gonna be essential for our common collaboration from those private sector or organizations. And, and what Apple and Google did together on contact tracing, I think is, you know, it's a fascinating story about collaboration and about an effort to hold those values while producing a derivative work with the right kinds of architectures of cooperation and, and participation. So, you know, I think what, one of the things that's really exciting about Kayak is that the these institutions that are here gathered um, will really hold that structure. And, and I'm really hopeful that many of these other uh, uh, private sector organizations that are major data holders and, and have profound AI capabilities can plug in here. Well, let's do, I mean, we're, we're almost out of time, but I just want to, um, let Lee and, and Robert maybe weigh in um, on the final a final point. Which you know, to me, one of the big stories of COVID is how um, how it reveals um, inequality, right? And this is one of the big you know, cultural phenomena right now. So um, I, I guess I'll, I'll go to to Lee and, and ask, you know, if you think that just as it's important to sort of um, guard against you know bias and ethical problems, if maybe we could try and sort of highlight and address some of those problems that are being revealed by COVID. Yeah, I mean, I um, I do think that the technology does have the capability um, to to try to help address some some of those issues. Um, I mean, just even taking a step back, you know, from from our experience of seeing the commercial world shift to 
um, a virtual world virtually overnight. Um, and you think about, you know, I'll take education as, as an example, um, you know, that there's been disparate um, in, in the US and other societies, disparate um, in access to education. But when you start conducting some education virtually, and I do think we need to get kids in the classroom, but it does create more opportunities to make some of the more gifted teachers in some of the more affluent schools available to students in um, less uh, rich communities. So, you know, I do think that the, the technology will enable us to address um, some of those issues. I know there's also a lot of um, important work going on about using AI to try to detect human trafficking um, and, and other types of um, ailments that have been exacerbated through through COVID. And I do want to circle back to, to Andrew's point. Um, you know, I do think that there is an important role um, for the private sector to play in all of these efforts too. Um, there's a lot of great work going on um, within industry, within academia, um, to try to support uh, the development of ethical AI. And I really do think it takes a village um, to really land in, in the right place because ultimately, you know, we do want to create um, technologies and create an environment where people can capitalize on their benefits um, and put up whatever guardrails are needed to prevent some of the harms. Right. Okay. Well, and, and Robert, do you want to um, talk about that from the sort of UN perspective, from a global perspective? You know, inequality is is sort of evident from that in that sense as well. Is that is that one of the big things you'd hope to address? Um, here. I'm also keen to hear more about if you would like to talk more about the infodemic. It's it's striking to me that that's one of the big big problems here. And I'm wondering if that affects different nations in different ways. Well, I, I mean, certainly we've been working very closely with uh, WHO and actually now helping uh, them build a data science team specifically on infodemics and countering infodemics. Um, uh, this is an area that they are incredibly concerned about. It's just, as I understand their number one priority in terms of the health risks. Um, uh, and I think, you know, as we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, I um, mean, people frequently comment that this has been kind of an, a massive accelerator of everything. It's been an accelerator of risks and an accelerator of opportunities. Um, you know, every all of the institutional mindset, cultural, bureaucratic barriers to innovating and deploying these kinds of technologies um, to fight the pandemic seem to have fallen away in some ways. Um, and some of the barriers that have fallen away are um, concerns about privacy and, and ethics as well. Um, that, you know, the calculus here um, is simply we have to save lives and we can't worry about that now and re regulation will take too long. Um, a, a consequence, of course, and one of the other things that's been accelerated here is inequality. Um, and so as we think about, you know, how to do this in a responsible way, we need, to, uh, re, we need a new governance framework around data, technology, and innovation, um, one that is able to balance the risks of misuse against the risks of misuse, the risks of not using these capabilities at all. Um, and I think you know, we have to acknowledge that the first generation of AI, which played a sort of critical role in digital advertising, empowering the business models of companies that don't need to be named, um, has proven itself to be one of the greatest accelerators of income inequality in the history of the world, right? A massive wealth concentration machine. So how do we make sure that AI is, is a tool for empowerment in the future? And I think we need to be thinking about this. We don't want to stifle innovation, but we need to be innovating in responsible ways um, as we move forward. Um, it's important to, to recognize this, and this has been touched on, it's not a zero sum game here between privacy and utility. It is not. And we're starting to see, for example, even some emerging research in the last few months around secure multi-party computation and zero knowledge based approaches to training machine learning, which is super exciting. And this is what this is going to be a kind of critical capability um, in the years ahead. We've got to build models that don't require access to the raw data necessarily. So we're looking forward to continuing to work with our partners in public sector and private sector and civil society um, toward, yeah, you know, including UNESCO, toward working on governance frameworks um, around responsible AI, because we think this is incredibly important. I would just note in conclusion, um, as we come out of this trying to take lessons for the future, 
we need to be applying AI and, and thinking about how to apply AI, AI in the future, not just for better responses to these kinds of crises, but using prediction for prevention. Right? The, the focus on preventing these crises from happening in the first place um, should be a principal investment. Okay, well, um, we haven't yet been cut off, so I guess we'll just keep going. Um, and I want to- Great, uh, Will, we have actually hit our time here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I, just let me say quickly, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Lee, Robert, Andrew, Yoshia, um, and Sasha for that. And uh, I'll hand back to you, Michael. Great. Well, thanks, Will, for moderating and uh, to all the panelists for sharing their insights uh, on the challenges and opportunities for you, the use of AI to address COVID-19. We had a really rich discussion, and I'm sorry that we had to cut it off early. Now we'd like to turn to Tom Siebel, the chairman and CEO of C3AI. Tom, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to have an opportunity to share with you what we have been up to at C3.ai as it relates to um, you know, accelerating research as it relates to COVID. Uh, as background, at C3.ai, we are an enterprise application software company, and we've built a platform. We've spent, say, the last decade and about a billion dollars building a software platform that allows organizations to uh, really leverage the power of elastic cloud computing, big data, the Internet of Things, and predictive analytics um, to design, develop, provision, and operate uh, applications uh, in kind of commercial industrial AI at very large scale. And we've developed this model driven architecture that is unique and innovative. And allows our customers that are typically large multinational organizations to rapidly design, develop, provision, and operate these applications in the area of you know, smart grid analytics, digital oil fields, um, a predictive maintenance for uh, the United States Air Force for aircraft, route optimization, production scheduling, um, and money laundering, what have you. And we apply these applications in banking, travel, transportation, oil and gas, financial services, telecommunications, kind of a writ large around the globe. Now, when we when the pandemic hit in the United States earlier this year, it became apparent to us that we had a technology foundation that we could use to, uh, you know, really accelerate research as it relates to, you know, applying AI to these data sets and to, you know, understand the course of disease and mitigation measures better. So the initial effort, we embarked on two large scale initiatives. One is the C3 AI Digital Transformation Institute, and this is a consortium of a number of leading uh, research institutions uh, in a coordinated effort to advance uh, digital transformation of society writ large. And the partners in this collaboration include C3.ai, Microsoft, the University of Illinois at Urbana, UC Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Princeton, University of Chicago, Stanford University, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications and Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And this initiative is funded for the first five years to the tune of about $300 million to advance the science of digital transformation as it relates to precision medicine, manufacturing processes, smart cities, what have you. And the, the it's multifaceted, including the annual research awards, visiting professors, curriculum development, uh, the advancement and, and deployment of an advanced data analytics platform. We have a distance learning program, industry partners, and importantly, all the work that comes out of the C3 AI Digital Transformation Institute goes into the public domain as non-exclusive royalty-free licensing. And so the idea is that every six months we will do a call for papers and in April, uh, we did a call for papers on um, amongst these institutions uh, to the, related to the, the development of advanced AI techniques to mitigate the pandemic, include, including COVID-19. So these would include topics like applying machine learning methods to mitigate the spread of the pandemic, genome-specific medical protocols, biomedical informatics methods, the design and sharing of clinical trials, modeling, simulation, prediction of uh, COVID propagation, 
and efficacy of the interventions and what have you. And so in response to that call for papers, we had um, you know, 201 submissions, uh, 80, 185 of which were qualified. These went through a kind of very rigorous uh, peer review process um, uh, with the academic leaders at these institutions. And they ultimately, um, I think 500 reviewers participated in this process and 26 proposals were selected for funding. And these proposals were include generally in the area of mathematical modeling, controls and logistics, uh, AI for epidemiology, social good and clinical use, vaccine and drug discovery, computational biology, uh, imaging and computer vision, distributed computing, the social impact of COVID and intelligent database search. And so the uh, recipients of these awards will receive between $100,000 and I think a half a million dollars cash in addition to access to massive computing resources at the um, Blue Waters 26 petaflop uh, computer at the University of Illinois, uh, the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs computers, and then massive computing resources from uh, Microsoft uh, in the Azure cloud. Now, the second initiative that we launched in response to uh, the COVID initiative or the COVID uh, pandemic uh, relates to the C3 AI data lake. And the you know, one of the aspects of this model that we put together, this platform, is that we're able to aggregate very large sets of data, you know, hundreds of petabytes of data, structured data, non-structured data, telemetry, what have you, into a unified federated image and make this data available for data scientists to do research, whether the problem will be fraud detection, precision medicine, what have you. And uh, as we move into you know, March, April, May, we begin to see many organizations publishing their data sets, whether it be the Census Bureau, the World Health Organization, MITRE Corporation, Johns Hopkins, what have you, and making these uh, data available in the public domain for research scientists to uh, understand the course of disease. And when we look at these data sets, most of them actually look like a list of URLs. And when you click on one of the URLs, we get, you know, 57 journal articles or whatever they are. So it's basically kind of lists. And then there was a, a couple of efforts by Google and AWS to create the idea of a data lake where they took these discrete data sets and stored them in a common location, say in, a, in, the, in, in the Google Cloud or an S3. And each of these data sets are basically unique, discrete, non-integrated data sets that might contain telemetry, might contain images, might contain text from journal articles. And it's incumbent upon the data scientists to figure out how to integrate all these data. Well, what we did with the uh, C3 AI data lake is we took the union of these data sets, okay, and aggregated them into a unified federated image uh, on a common foundation and uh, enabling and establishing all of the connections of, between these data, allowing the data scientists to search by, you know, outbreak location, line list, you know, biological asset, you know, population data, you know, whatever it may be, vaccine coverage. And in each of these cases, it goes to, you know, whether we're dealing with text, telemetry, um, uh, CT scans, uh, um, radiography, whatever it might be, it goes and collects all of the relevant data and prevents the, presents these data to researchers in a line list. And so this was a process that we began in, uh, let's see, I believe in April. And I think now we've aggregated um, 30 uh, of these data sets into a unified federated image. And we've published these uh, to the research community writ large. Uh, this is available on the C3 platform. It's all of these data are available through basically um, any utility that supports a RESTful API. So you can access these data through the C3 AI suite or Tableau or Amazon SageMaker, uh, Microsoft BI directly from R, Python, Scala, what have you. And uh, the data sets that we've aggregated are really quite comprehensive. We believe that we're building here, you know, the world's largest corpus of data uh, related to COVID uh, so that researchers can, um, you know, 
uh, perform meaningful analyses of these data and hopefully um, then um, inform, you know, better informed and better qualified policy decisions. Uh, this was the time frame to aggregate all these data sets. We did this over a period of about three months. So it's really, I think, quite an accomplishment. And the data set is extensible so that any researcher can add their own data. Uh, the data are highly secure. Uh, we are subject to some of the most uh, robust uh, security protocols in existence, uh, be it HIPAA, SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3, uh, NIST, uh, NERC, SIP, FedRAMP, what have you. So the security protocols as it relates to personally identifiable information or um, HIPAA information are really quite robust. And so this is what we have provided, this utility now, I and mean, this is being uh, I should I should comment that the the Digital Transformation Institute is receiving substantial support from Microsoft. Uh, the C3 AI Data Lake is receiving substantial support from um, uh, AWS, and this is now published as a utility available to the world for free to you know better understand the course of the disease, uh, the efficacy of social distancing programs, um, evaluating. Uh, the, um, the, you know, potential benefits and problems associated with, you know, social distancing or, you know, business reopening or what have you. And um, we have about almost 2,000 registered data lake users. We've been in, you know, very active cooperation with the C3 DTI uh, partners in addition to CDC, uh, National Institute, NIH, and others who are participating. Uh, in this process of the selection and qualification of these data sets. Um, we had, you know, 26,000 API calls last week. Uh, there's been almost 200,000 uh, API calls to date. And uh, we were very active research going on at, you know, MIT, Berkeley Labs, um, Arizona State University, CDC, NIH. And this is avail immediately available to you uh, and, and and to this effort. Um, the, um, the it is, is very well documented um, uh, uh, on the web. I think if you look at you know c three ai dot you know c three dot ai covid, it'll take you to this web page. It'll show you how to use it, uh, how to interact with it, and how to use it to your advantage. So I believe that we are publishing here. You know, the world's largest cor corpus of data related to COVID in a unified federated image where we have established all the connections and remove and and eliminated perhaps 95% of the work that data scientists normally has to do. And, um, you know, these are been very exciting, uh, very interesting initiatives. And I think the probability of something good uh, not coming out of this Digital Transformation Institute and the C3 AI Data Lake approaches zero. So um, thank you for all that you're doing. We look forward to uh, partnering in this initiative to advance uh, research as it relates to COVID uh, writ large. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the work that we've been doing in the last few months. Thank you, Tom, for that overview of C3's work on COVID-19 and for your partnership and support for Kayak. Next, we have His Excellency Manuel Muniz, the State Minister for Global Spain. Manuel? Um, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm very sorry I couldn't be with you. Um, I had, a, I had an, an issue with the scheduling that prevented me from being with you, but actually I, I feel very strongly about the event and about the topic that you're going to discuss. Having been involved here from Spain, in the management of one of the toughest uh, and more severe um, cases of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I can tell you that this is a major, major challenge for societies and for governments to deal with. It's not just a health challenge, although I'm going to focus my remarks on the health issue so that I can connect with the work being done by, by Kayak and, and your project on data and AI, but it's also an economic challenge it's a governance uh, and competence uh, and, and policy crafting challenge, and it's also an ethical, an ethical and a normative challenge when it comes to dealing with both the management of the pandemic and also the exit strategies or the de-escalation strategies that most of the world is now engaged in. Uh, uh, and, and, and these issues, having lived, lived them firsthand, 
I can tell you our highly, the efficacy of our response is highly dependent on the tools that we use to assess the situation. Actually, I was speaking with a colleague of mine, an epidemiologist, and he told me people think that epidemiology is the science of epidemics, but actually it's the science of the management of data in the health space. It just happens that epidemics is one of the ways in which this manifests itself, but actually it's the science of the management of data. Um, so data management is vital for this. And I can tell you that our epidemiological information systems need to be upgraded. This is true almost across the board. Uh, they need to be much, uh, much more live and up to date. Um, we, they need to be much more precise and granular. Uh, if we are to understand how the epidemic is behaving and evolving in different uh, places and locations, and we are to craft and tailor specific responses. I think this is one of the big learning outcomes. As you know, we have a, a sentinel system that was built around the flu to assess the evolution of the flu. Uh, so basically what it does is it tracks uh, symptom symptomatology that is, uh, that is similar to that of the flu, and it, it allows you to assess um, you know, the state of the epidemic, whether it's going up or down, depending on the season. And we need to develop systems that are, that are much more granular, much more sophisticated and sensitive to cases like COVID and others so that we can respond in time. Because time is here of the absolute essence when it comes to responding to these crises. And I think we need to bring to bear the tools of technology, particularly data, not just data gathering, but data analytics and AI. Uh, when it comes to the response. So I, th I think that you're discussing a, a, a very central issue and that the project that is being presented is, is particularly uh, poignant uh, given, given the phase that we're at and that solutions coming out of your discussions I think would be extremely helpful for governments, um, for governments around the world. Just a final note on this uh, and just a brief note on the situation in Europe and in Spain. As you know, we've, we have now managed to flatten the epidemiological curve with huge cost and sacrifice. Um, it, it, was, it hit the peak uh, of the, particularly of deaths in Spain at the end of March. The generalized confinement has worked and we're now in lower figures, but now we enter a very different phase where we need to navigate a tension between the opening of our economy and the return of mobility and what that does to the circulation of the pandemic and the, risk, the, the increase in risk of contagion that that brings. And I mean mobility both within our borders, but also across borders. We've now opened our international border to EU, Schengen countries, and a, and a number of other, of other countries. So Spain is now in the same situation as almost the totality of the Schengen space uh, and EU countries, where we need to live within this tension of these two forces. Uh, and again, I think that information and uh, data analytics will be vital for us to navigate these two boundaries of mobility and risk. Uh, so again, it couldn't be more important. I'm sorry I can't be with you, and I hope, uh, I hope uh, it goes extremely well, and we're all looking forward to the outcome and the output uh, of your gathering and the work being done by Kayak and by colleagues uh, Nico and Cyrus and the rest uh, from over there. So thank you for the invitation, and best of luck with the, with the work. Bye-bye. Thank you, Manuel. And as our final speaker, I'd like to invite Vilas Starr, a trustee with the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Vilas. Thanks, Michael, for that warm introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be with you today as a trustee of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. We are a philanthropic organization that focuses on identifying, equipping, and championing the frontier uses of data and AI science for the public good. I'm particularly happy to be here with you today to support the creation of Kayak both from the role of the work that the institution will do, but also to promote the role of the civil society sector in both equipping ourselves to stand forward and support good uses of data, but also to play a role that the social sector has often played when the world faces great global challenges, to both understand and equip great advances for the benefit of humanity and to protect those most vulnerable. The work of Kayak for us underlines two key themes of our work. The first that even as data continues to drive better policymaking, we need to revisit and re-understand values of collaboration and sharing in how we think of data, not simply as a private asset, but also as a public good. Second, we need to contemplate and understand how new institutions and platforms can support the mechanics of data sharing to ensure that we're not simply moving bits and bytes, but also moving insights, capturing that work, and making sure that we have multi-partner collaborations that are able to analyze and use the insights that come out of those data sharing mechanisms to drive great policy. 
there are few silver linings, but in a time of great crisis, such as the one that COVID-19 has presented to the world, we feel like this is a moment to really understand, equip, and validate the fundamental ideas of how we do better data collaboration in the pursuit of better outcomes for humanity. We're very happy to support Kaya, and we're excited to see what comes in the year ahead. Thank you, Michael, back to you. Thank you, Vilas. We really appreciate uh, the McGovern Foundation's support and your support for Kayak and our division of what we're trying to create. And I want to thank the audience for joining the Kayak launch. As many of the speakers highlighted, data is more abundant today than at any time in the past. Our challenge is in sharing and making sense of that data, gleaning insights, and providing those insights to decision makers. And as many of the speakers highlighted, to do so in a way that is trustworthy, sustainable, and ethical, and respects human rights. That's our hope for Kayak. We firmly believe that the problems of this scale can only be addressed through global cooperation that brings to bear expertise from multiple disciplines using the most powerful tools available and engaging stakeholders across all sectors. All of us at HAI and at Kayak member organizations care deeply about this global pandemic, and we hope you will join us in this effort. This concludes our program for today. If you're on the high mailing list or you registered for this event in advance, You'll receive emails from Kayak or HAI with further updates and future events. You can also subscribe to the HAI mailing list at the bottom of any page on the High website. And you can also visit the newly launched Kayak website at kayak19.org. That's C-A-I-A-C-19.org. Thank you.